research. How gene editing demands a new relationship between science and society. Kevin Esfeldt, MIT. On the 9th of November 1989, I was a second grader in Seattle. An old wall near our school had just been demolished, and we were told a far more important wall had similarly come down on the other side of the world. Six years ago, no one imagined that we might be able to readily edit the traits of entire species. The very idea that we could alter a pre-existing species seems to have been completely absent even from science fiction. But today, thanks to a technology known as CRISPR gene drive, a single researcher can theoretically make and release organisms that over many generations will eventually alter an entire wild population. Used wisely, gene drive technology could help us eradicate diseases such as malaria and schistosomiasis that could save millions of lives. We could use it to improve animal well-being, perhaps as much as if we ended factory farming. But if we use it recklessly, then it could devastate public trust in both science and governance at a time when we can least afford it. I hold myself morally responsible for all the consequences of its use, whatever those might be, because I was the one who first showed the world that it was possible. But even so, I'm actually less concerned with how we use the technology than I am with what we can learn from the story of its development, because that story shines a spotlight on a flaw in the way that we do science, one that actually creates an emerging existential risk, that in the future, we might discover a similarly unimagined technology that could perhaps be equally accessible, even more powerful, and unlike gene drive, biased towards destruction. The term existential risk is technical, but technical words really aren't adequate for something that would mean the end of civilization and possibly the non-existence of our descendants. It threatens everything not only that we care for, but the hopes and dreams of almost everyone who has ever lived. So let's abandon technical language and fall back on myth. Consider Yggdrasil, the world tree, the tree of knowledge. I became a scientist and inventor because I see our story, humanity's story, as a heroic journey of discovery. Our ancestors, from the depths of ignorance, managed to climb the tree of knowledge, exploring new branches, gathering the fruits, and using them to give us the world that we have today. That's a world with less poverty and violence, less hunger, less human suffering than ever before in history. And today, we continue their great work in much the same way. When we have a brilliant idea about a promising new branch of the tree, then we cobble together resources, and we launch an expedition. To the, we venture to the frontiers of knowledge and beyond, we gather what fruits we can find, and we bring them back. Now, there are many such expeditions now. There are many more scientists than ever before. But we don't know what any of the others are doing. We don't know where they're going, and we don't really know why. And that's because most scientists are afraid. They're afraid if they tell others what they're doing, then someone else will rush there and get there first, steal all the fruit, and get all the credit. And so they keep their plans a secret. This doesn't work out well. This prevents us from coordinating our efforts to efficiently explore the tree of knowledge. And it means we often end up exploring a branch only to find that it's bare. And that branch might have been seen by someone else before, and we just don't know. If science were more open, we wouldn't have these problems. In fact, I might go so far as to say that no rational human today would ever design the current 
scientific enterprise. There's, it just doesn't make any sense. But then no human did design it. It evolved, and it evolved back when the most efficient way to share information with another scientist was to write words on paper and send them off by horse and by sailing ship. And even though today we can freely share information with everyone in the world at no cost, we still haven't updated the system. We're still shackled by those antiquated incentives, which both slow our progress and, I would argue, are now unsafe. Even so, it's a tremendous honor and privilege to be one of those granted the ability to explore the tree and to do as much good as we can. Six years ago, I played a very minor role in developing CRISPR genome editing. Now, CRISPR is a molecular scalpel that can cut and therefore edit almost any gene in just about any genome of any organism. And in the spring of 2013, I was walking in a park, looking at various things around me, and I was wondering whether any of these wild organisms would ever be edited with CRISPR. And I thought, well, probably not, because you see, when we alter an organism, we're diverting its resources for our benefit and away from replication in the wild. And that means that natural selection always wipes it out. But in the laboratory, I thought, we use genome editing to cut the original version and replace it with our version. That gives an advantage to our version. And I wondered, could we maybe make that happen in the wild every generation? So suppose that when we edit an organism, we insert not just the change we want to make, but also the instructions for making that change, such that then CRISPR will cut that copy of the gene. It will also, once in place, then it will cut the other copy of the gene. So now this organism here has two copies. And that means that when it mates, all of the offspring are guaranteed to inherit a copy. And in those offspring, genome editing happens again in the reproductive cells, meaning all of the next generation will inherit a copy, and the next, and the next, and the next, until the entire population has the alteration. The day I first thought of this was a day of pure elation, because windows of possibility just seemed to open up all around. The heavy weight of moral responsibility descended somewhat later. But the first thing that I did before even asking my thankfully much wiser than I mentors and colleagues for advice on how to deal with this was to consider the possibility for mass harm. And fortunately, there isn't much. And that's because CRISPR gene drive is slow. It spreads parents to offspring over many successive generations. It's obvious. You can't hide it from DNA sequencing, the cost of which has been falling faster than Moore's law. And once you see a gene drive system, if you don't like it, you can always build another one that will cut that one you don't like and replace it with a harmless version. Nothing slow, obvious, and easily blocked is going to present much of a threat, no matter what it can do. And so in that sense, we're lucky. But that's only physical harm. What would happen if a scientist were to build one of these self-propagating gene drives in the laboratory, and it escaped into a wild population and began spreading? Well, I can imagine the headline. It'd probably be something like, scientists accidentally turn entire species into GMOs. Is CRISPR to blame? And then we'd have a little bit more trouble than we even have now deciding how to use biotechnology wisely. So when we did decide to tell the world about it, we did a number of things. First, we decided to tell people before we actually tested in the lab, because we wanted to set a precedent of early transparency in research to give communities the opportunity to weigh in on those early stage research decisions that would ultimately affect how their environment is altered. So we encouraged early transparency and called for other researchers to follow our example. We also called for regulatory reform. We laid out technical safeguards to ensure that even if someone did make gene drives in the laboratory 
and someone else broke into the lab and let all the organisms loose, it still wouldn't spread in the wild. And we wanted all scientists everywhere to be aware of this so they didn't accidentally make one of these things, not realizing the consequences. So we made as much noise as we could. We published in Science, we got coverage in the New York Times, Scientific American, international outlets, you name it. So we did the best we could. I'm sure someone could have done better, but we did the best we could. How did it turn out? On the bright side, there have been no accidental releases of gene drive systems. So that's good. However, only four governments in the world have actually done any kind of regulatory reform for gene drive. And although many funders who support this kind of research have talked a very good game about ethics and ensuring that transparency in communities having a voice is important, they haven't actually done anything to require it. So all those terrible incentives are still in place. Most research is still closeted. And as for other scientists, well, only a few months after our media frenzy, some researchers who hadn't seen any of it independently came up with the same idea, but as a laboratory tool. Up to after the point where they actually built it in the laboratory, in fruit flies, they weren't aware that it might spread in the wild. So the story of CRISPR gene drive shows us that even brilliant, well-meaning scientists, for they are, can't reliably anticipate the consequences of their work. The world is too complicated. We cannot expect that of scientists. And due to the secrecy, even other scientists who do anticipate a hazard can't effectively warn others. And of course, the technology itself shows that sometimes we gain powers that were previously unimagined very, very rapidly. So suppose that out there somewhere on the world tree, there is a delicious-looking fruit that, if tasted, would give many people tremendous destructive powers. Well, what happens when many have the destructive powers of gods to which even gods are vulnerable? And the answer is Ragnarok, the shaking of the world tree and the destruction of civilization. Now, you might say, no scientist would ever do that. If they saw something that dangerous, they would, never, they would never tell the world about that. And no, they probably wouldn't, if they were aware of it. And even if 99 scientists looked down that hazardous branch and said, that's too dangerous, I'm not going there, if just one of them says, no, I think those benefits might be worth it, and does, then that information gets out. There is such a thing as an information hazard. Gene drive is not the only thing that can spread uncontrollably due to the actions of a single individual. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can't do is stop exploring the tree of knowledge. Because even though our current perch in the world tree is an enviable one, our civilization is ecologically unsustainable. We have to continue discovering just to stay where we are, let alone to keep making the world a better place. The challenge of our time is to figure out how to explore the world tree wisely. How do we accelerate the discovery of beneficial discoveries while avoiding branches that carry possible existential and catastrophic risks? One thing we can do is change those incentives. Encourage peer review, not after the results, after the expedition comes back, but before it's going to set out. That way, that peer advice can improve the odds of success. It could also possibly spot a hazard in time to actually do something about it. Second, we should have funding opportunities for scientists that do spot a hazard to research alternatives that could remove the incentive to explore that hazardous branch. Third, we should be more cautious about how we talk about specific hazards that could inflict mass harm. Don't write about them if you know of one. And if you see someone else do that, try not to link to or cite it. What's more, respect the caution of others. If someone tells you that your research might have troublesome implications, then respect their caution. They may know more than you. At the end of the day, given the stakes, this is about humility. We don't actually know whether there are catastrophic risks out there, fruits just waiting to be plucked. But we do live in a universe in which thermodynamics says it is always easier to destroy 
than it is to protect. So as the power of technology increases, the risk of discovering an existential threat will only grow. So let's make science both more open and more cautious. Because when the actions of one can affect everyone, we can no longer afford serious mistakes. Thank you.